Hello, and welcome to our first Women in the Public Sector event this academic year. Um, we're so pleased that you all can make it here with us tonight. My name is Nicole Elias, and this is Maria Diagostino. We're both members of the Department of Public Management, and we are the co-founders of WPS. So last year, Maria and I really started thinking about um, our shared research interests. We were thinking about conversations that we had in student with students, discussions in class, and we realized this need for a more concerted effort to focus on women in the public sector. So we developed uh, Women in the pu Public Sector series with our goals being really to educate, engage, and foster a consortium of students, faculty, and community members that focus on projects like this tonight. Um, last year, we held a workshop as well as a panel discussion in the spring that explored some of these most pressing issues that women in public service face. So how many of you have been to one or both of our events last year? Okay, excellent, a couple, but we've got primarily uh, newbies here this year. And <clears throat> this is not like class. So for my students, this is one of the only times I will encourage you to take out your phones and begin tweeting. This is our handle up here. Um, and we've got a number of hashtags that are listed on uh, this paper on top of your folders. So please, tweet away. For those of you that don't have Twitter, and, and I've heard that uh, around the room, some of you don't have Twitter accounts, feel free to use Instagram. Um, we'll be creating an account very soon. So, um, Now, from last year's feedback on the two events that we held, we really heard uh, overwhelmingly across the board from students that you were really interested in understanding more about mentorship and negotiation. And <clears throat> that's exactly what we're going to focus on tonight. Um, so here with us, <coughs> excuse me, we have Darlene Martinez, who is the Director of Human Resources with the City of New York Business Integrity Commission, as well as Sarah Sullivan, um, who is a senior program associate at the Vera Institute. And then finally, uh, in the back corner here, we have Will Simpkins, the director of the Center for Career and Professional Development at the college. Um, Will will be leading our workshop tonight, so a bit about Will. Um, in his current role right now, he oversees career services programs for approximately 15,000 undergraduates and graduate students at John Jay, um, as well as thousands of alums throughout the nation. Um, he re received his BA in English from Virginia Tech, go Hokies, you know, um, and his master's in counseling and personnel services from the University of Maryland and he is currently working toward his doctorate at NYU. So please join me in welcoming Will Simpkins. So Professor Ellis and I went to the same school and I've already done the fight chant um, and I won't do it again because I feel like I'd probably just embarrass myself more than anything. Um, so I want to acknowledge the sort of elephant in the room this is a forum on women in the public sector, and you've got a dude up here um, <laughs> imparting knowledge. So the question that I want to start with is, um, and I'll just fast forward through this, because I'm keeping you all in, your, in the seat of your pants. Um, why do I care about this topic so much, and why am I here talking to you? Um, early in my career, I worked at a um, private elite women's college here in New York City. And for about 10 years, I worked specifically with young women who were interested in careers in public service, whether that was nonprofits or in government agencies um, or doing good things in the corporate uh, world, because that does happen sometimes. <laughs> um, and I learned a lot from, from their struggles um, through internships, helping them find internships, going through their job searches with them, and staying in touch for many, many years with many of my students. Um, 
At the same time, one year, uh, we had a guest speaker at the college, a woman named Peggy McIntosh. Has anybody ever heard of Peggy McIntosh? Okay, I'm gonna welcome you to her world. Um, Peggy McIntosh is a scholar at Wellesley College, and she wrote an article called, this is the one everybody knows her for, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack of White Privilege. Um, and it was sort of a groundbreaking article that listed 150 privileges that I, as a white person, have that people of color don't. Um, and, and it's all over the internet, so if you want to read it, Google it and find it. She also wrote an article called Feeling Like a Fraud. And it stems from her experience as an invited panelist at a conference with several other um, accomplished women in their fields. And she noticed that all of the panelists qualified their remarks. I think I could be wrong. Feel free to disagree with me. And she said, wouldn't it be a better world, A, if women didn't feel the need to qualify their remarks? Wouldn't it also be a better world if more men would feel the need to qualify their remarks? Sort of two sides of the same coin. But in this article, she talks about the feeling of turning in a paper, getting an A on it, and thinking, I must have really pulled one over on my professor there. Never thinking that you're quite good enough, never claiming the mantle of being the expert, of having a value, of having worth to offer to an organization. And that, that article, Feeling Like a Fraud, um, I've carried it with me for the rest of my career because it really spoke to me for a number of reasons. So I think tonight what I want us to um, talk about is negotiation and mentorship are not just about getting ahead in your chosen field, career field. It's also about claiming the worth of who you are as a person. We all have value. We all are an expert in something, and we all bring those qualities to the organizations in which we work. So negotiation and mentorship are as much about empowering yourself as they are about getting ahead in your field. All right, so um, we're going to talk a little bit about the gender gap, because I think that sets the, the scene for why negotiation and mentorship are so important. Then we're going to talk about negotiation, and then we're going to talk about mentorship. Um, and you're going to enjoy my lovely graphics for the evening. Um, so the gender gap, is that a term? Has anybody never heard this term, the gender gap? Good, okay. So here's where we are right now. Um, in 2012, women earned 77% of men's earning. So you've probably heard the 77 cents. Sometimes it's 78 cents. Sometimes it's 75 cents. It varies year to year. If you look at the graph on the top, you can actually see this broken down um, by race. So you, the blue bar is men, so that's a dollar. Then you have white women at 77 cents. You have uh, black women at, and because I can't read that far, um, I think it's 69 cents. Uh, and Latino women at, I think that's 57 cents. If somebody can see it better than me, scream it out. Um, 59? 57, okay. So, it's not just a men versus women. It's a complicated issue with many different variables playing a role here. Um, it's important to remember that in uh, 1972, the overall number was 58%. So 1972, somebody do the math, that's 42 years ago. We've made 20% progress in 42 years. And there's a lot of research right now that shows that the, the gender gap is not going away. If we continue on the same trajectory that we are right now, it may close by 2075. That's a long time. None of us will be working in 2075. I may be alive then. I'm not sure. I'd be old at that point. Um, in New York State, it's actually 86%. So not quite as bad as the national average. Um, there's a report from the Bureau of Labor Statistics um, that uh, we can send out the link later to, or tweet it out, um, that actually details all 50 states in the District of Columbia and plots out where they are along this continuum. And in some states, I believe West Virginia is actually the worst. West Virginia is still hovering around that 57% number, right? Um, so, the, uh, the other thing to remember is that the gap narrows in times of economic distress when the economy is constricting and it widens in boom times. Why is that? 
because bonuses predominantly go to men. Men overpower women in numbers in fields where you're likely to find a bonus structure, finance, consulting, corporate law. Um, so a lot of people say, well, you know, that's all well and good, but it's really the choices that women make that limit their opportunity to earn or accomplish what men accomplish in their fields of interest. So here's some of the choices that, that people talk about. They choose different majors, education versus economics. They choose different occupations, social work, well, we're just going to stick with this, versus economics, versus finance, right? Women tend to work fewer hours even when they work full time, so the difference of a 35 hour full time work week and an 80 hour full time work week. Women are more likely to leave the workforce or work part time after they have children. So all of this can account for some of the variation. But in 2012, the American Association of University Women put out a report called Graduating to a Pay Gap that looked at what creates this gap for, for recent college graduates. They statistically accounted for all of these differences and still found a 7% difference in the earnings of men and women one year after graduation with no explanation other than gender. So I think the answer of do women's choices matter is yes and no. Everything is local, right? So when, if, when you're experiencing the gender gap, there are a number of factors that will play a role in how your career takes off over a 40, 50 year span. Um, but sometimes there are things that are out of your control. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about what we know about women in the workforce right now. So labor force participation, 57% of working age women are working versus 69, almost 70% of men. So there are less women in the workforce. If you look at the percentage of mothers, so the, the red are um, women who have children under the age of 18, or at the age 18, 69.9% of mothers are working. That's the overall number. 74.7, uh, so 75%, I believe that says 12 years of age. And the next one is six years of age. So mothers are working. So this can't explain the entire reason that there's a gender gap. Um, look at the full-time numbers in 2013. 74% of women worked full-time, while 87% of men worked full-time. This is a big one. How many of you in the room are interested in working for a federal agency? So there's a great um, article that I'll fish out in a minute that did, did a study and said from 2000 to 2012, this was in the Washington Post, the percentage of federal of women hired to federal jobs dropped 6% from 43% to 37%. Now, this Washington Post article had a hypothesis about why this is. Does anybody have a guess? Around the same time, the federal government created a veterans hiring initiative. So federal agencies were given, in some cases, quotas, in some cases were policies were changed to elevate veterans to the top of the list who are veterans. Predominantly, veterans are men, right? So it's the unintended outcomes of policy, and I am not a public administration faculty member, well, I sort of am, adjunct, but I am not from a public administration background, so many of you can probably explain this theory of how policies impact changes, especially in the workplace. In the world of finance, Women make 66% of male counterparts' salaries. And there's a study that we're going to talk about in a minute that found a 7.6% difference in uh, one year out MBA salary. So students who had graduated with a graduate degree in business, one year out, what were their salaries? And mothers earn 7 to 14% less over a lifetime than women without children. So it creates sort of a bleak picture for what women leaving college are walking into. So what else might be going on? So you, we've got women's numbers in the workforce, choosing to go to the workforce, choosing not to go to the workforce, different patterns of engagement in the workforce. We also have the gender gap that's been around for as long as any of us have been working. Any other thoughts about what's going on to create this situation? 
Thank you. I paid her to say that. <laughs> Women don't negotiate. So uh, in 2006, uh, a group of uh, scholars wrote a book called Women Don't Ask. It's, the research is a tiny bit dated now. It's almost 10 years old. But I think many of the thoughts in the book are still good. Um, they've continued to write about it after. So they did a study of uh, women in business. And again, they found this 7.6% difference in salaries between men and women. Then they looked at negotiation patterns. And this is really where it is. 7% of women reported negotiating their salary. 57% of men did, right? Those who negotiated were able to raise their salary by 7%. Okay, so you're like, all right, what's the difference between me accepting a $45,000 a year job versus me accepting a $40,000 a year job, right? Is it really worth me creating the persona of myself as maybe too assertive, maybe pushy, maybe too demanding, too entitled, in order to get $5,000 more a year? Well, if you work in the public sector, your salary grows based on percentages or based on step increases, right? So at John Jay, I get a raise every year that's written into my union contract. If I start lower, I'm never gonna catch up to somebody who started above me, right? So if you look, if you extrapolate out 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, this could have a really significant effect on your lifetime earnings in terms of negotiation. So it's not a momentary decision. Okay, I have to admit something. I did not negotiate my salary when I got a job at John Jay College. <laughs> and this is why I feel strongly about this, because the director of human resources at the time was very good at his job and sold me hard on why I should just accept the salary they offered. He made it so difficult for me to make a counter argument. I would have felt awful making a counter argument. I had every right to, and I know plenty of people who have. I just didn't. So I had to put it out there because um, I think all of us struggle with when do we negotiate and when do we not negotiate. So I, I think there's some questions that we all have to think about. And I'll, we'll just do raise of hands. Raise your hand if you think yes. Do women accept the status quo more readily than men? Yes. Okay, we feel strongly about that. <laughs> Are women taught not to promote their own interests? Yes. Are women met when a with a chilly reception when they do ask? Yes. Um, there's actually a study that looked at hiring managers, perceptions of negotiation from the other side, and it found that um, when women negotiate, their male hiring managers have a negative impression of them. When men negotiate, sorry, the southern accent came out. When men negotiate, their male hiring managers think nothing of it. When men negotiate with female hiring managers, they have a negative impression of the men. When women negotiate with other women hiring managers, it's a worse negative reception. Right? So it's not just a men versus women thing. There's a lot of deep psychology happening here. And I'm also not a psychologist, so I can't talk about that. Um, so this, this last question is, what are the repercussions of not asking? And we talked about lifetime earnings, but I think there is a psychological effect of this. This stays with you. If you are constantly feeling quite literally undervalued, you're gonna carry that with you on a daily, basis in the work that you do. All right, so um, there's a great woman at Stanford, Margaret Neal, and there's a, um, a packet in, there's a handout in your folder that is something that she created for the Lean In book. Does everybody know Lean In, Shel yeah. Sandberg's book? I have issues with that book. I think much of it is really good, but some of the materials that they created to help book groups are, through that are really great, and this is one of them. And so Margaret Neal came up, and there's also a really great video. If you Google her, you will find it. It's fantastic of her talking about um, why negotiation is important. She has a four-step process to negotiation. The first one is assess. Do the benefits of negotiating outweigh the costs of negotiating? It's gonna be different in every situation. She talks about 
not negotiating for her first job, I believe, at Georgetown because she didn't have as much to offer. It was her first job as a faculty member. She couldn't demand anything. She was a dime a dozen. But years later, when she went to Stanford, she had a reputation. They wanted her. So she was in a position to negotiate more effectively at that point. So do the benefits outweigh the costs? Assess the situation. Prepare. What are your interests? Why do you want whatever you're asking for? What do you get out of it? But then just as important, what do they get out of it? Whether it's your hiring manager, your supervisor, your CEO, whoever you're negotiating with, what does the other person get out of this negotiation? What can they gain? Gather evidence as well. Um, are your expectations about what you want realistic, right? You can ask for $40,000 raise. I don't have $40,000 to give you. Maybe I have 5,000. But you, your peers and colleagues can figure that out. And that's where mentorship comes in. Because a mentor or an insider, and I'll use the word gladiator for you scandal lovers. <laughs> your gladiators can help you gather this information. All right, next is the ask. But it's not the ask of negotiating. It's the, let me ask you some questions. Let me be curious about you. Let me find out more about who you are. What are your values? What can I bring to the table? What are you looking to get out of the situation? What's important to you? Then I'm going to speak directly to those things, because that's more likely to get me what I want than talking to you about things that you don't care about to begin with. Um, and then package. So it's not just about salary. It's about a whole benefits package. And I'm, Darlene is sort of nodding her head, probably not at this, but it, because she's a director of HR, later on I hope she's going to talk a little bit about the whole package, right? How can someone negotiate thinking holistically about their work in an organization? Um, if you flip the page on the negotiation handout, there's three questions that they talk about to prepare women to enter a negotiation. And I, I think they're important. And these are three things that you should, and, and this is not just women, right? This helps me negotiate. I've already told you I'm not a very good one, right? Obviously, if I didn't negotiate my salary and I was a director of career services, not a, that's like the blind leading the blind. Um, sorry. Why are you asking? How are you asking? And for whom are you asking? Are you asking for yourself or are you asking for others? There's some research that shows that while women are less likely to, to advocate for themselves, they are more likely to advocate for others. Right? Okay. So like we talked about, this is where the role of mentorship comes in. So mentorship is having someone who's going to call you on your crap, who's going to give you the lay of the land, who's going to educate you about the things that you can't see, right? And who at the end of the day is going to help you paint a picture, a truer picture, a more real picture. How many of you in the room right now feel like you have a mentor? Okay. How many of you feel like you are a mentor to someone else? Okay. How many of you feel like when I actually start talking about what mentorship is, you probably have one or are one, you just don't like to call it that? Thanks, Kim. Good. Okay. So um, mentorship. So a mentorship relationship, you know, we have these images in our head of like the big brothers, big sisters type of mentorship or a really concrete structured program where people are paired up. But a mentor is really just someone that you can bounce ideas off of on a long-term basis. My mentor is my former boss. 15, 16 years ago. I maybe talk to her three times a year, um, and that includes the holiday card that I get at some point. But it's, I know that I can always call her if I'm in a sticky situation and need some help, right? So mentorship is about cultivating a relationship, and that involves a lot of asking. Mentors don't have to be above you in the hierarchy. They could be beside you. They could be below you. As a supervisor, I have learned a tremendous amount from the people that work for me. They've helped me understand how to be a better professional in my area, and I think that's really critical. But the important thing to remember is it always is a two-way street. What are you offering your mentor? What are they offering you? All right, I'm getting the cut the time, and luckily, we're at the end of my presentation. So um, I want to encourage you to tweet questions or ask questions, but I'm going to ask our panelists 
to come to the super formal panelists table. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about who they are, um, which you've already gotten. But I just want to say again, Sarah Sullivan is a senior program associate at the Vera Institute of Justice um, with the Center on Sentencing and Corrections. And if you read her full bio, you're sort of going to be blown away. Um, and think about the access that she has had over her career with very high profile people um, doing very high profile work. Darlene Martinez is the Director of Human Resources with the City of New York Business Integrity Commission, otherwise known as BIC. Mm -hmm. um, she is also a frequent recruiter at John Jay. You may have seen her at our recent career fair. <laughs> and she is also an alum of John Absolutely. Jay. Woo -hoo. <laughs> Sarah, you are not an alum of John Jay. So Half my office is, so I feel like okay. I'm an honorary right. member. <laughs> she did admit to being in the Baruch MPA program. <laughs> I'm going to throw that out there. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, what I'm going to do is ask our panelists a few questions, and Natalie's going to time me to make sure that I don't go over, and I want to make sure that we have a little bit of time for you guys to ask them some questions. Then we're going to break into small groups and do allow you a chance, uh, the chance to role play some of these questions with each other, and you'll have uh, someone from the staff at your table with you. All right, so I'm just going to throw this one out. Do you consider yourself an effective negotiator? I feel like that's a work in progress for me. Um, when I first started my career, like Will, you know, whenever there was a salary offered, it was kind of like, okay, well, thank you very much. I was just so happy to be offered anything that I would just go ahead and take it. Um, but certainly as I grew into, you know, my career, I, I realized that, wait a minute, I have something special to offer here, so I, I can negotiate a little bit. And, um, you know, well, my situation is actually a little bit um, unique in that when I first started with BIC, I started sort of at a low-level position. I was a paralegal, which, like you said, came a dime a dozen. And as I, um, you know, grew and, and um, you know, got promoted a couple of times, I became the director eventually, that's when I started to realize, like, wait, hold on. You know, what my salary currently is is not comparable to what others are making across the city. Because, you know, I did my research. That's one thing I want to, you know, highlight. It's important that before you go ahead and negotiate, you want to research. You want to ask yourself, what is what I'm asking for? Is that reasonable? Is that realistic? Because like the example that Will gave, you don't want to go in and asking for $40,000 when, you know, someone in your position is making, you know, far less than what you're asking for. So first of all, you want to ask yourself, okay, what is currently being offered sort of as a benchmark in my, in my, um, my role, my position. And before you go in, you want to, of course, research. And then you want to ask yourself, and this is what I did, was how long have I been in this role? I've been in this role for six years now. So, you know, that's a good time to now say, well, I should be at this level. So I went ahead and I researched. I looked at, I assessed. I looked at where I was in my career, and I felt confident enough to say, well, I can go in and ask for X amount of dollars, which is so funny that we're having this discussion right now, because actually I did this recently, and it, I was very successful. But in doing so, I had to do my background, and I did that, and I went ahead and I, and I asked, and I said, well, you know, this is what I'm asking for, and this is what you can expect of me. Because you don't want to just go ahead and ask for something that you don't want to lay out that I'm going to give this, this to you in return. So those are the three things that I had to do and I learned and I was successful in. So in, in, in that regard, I would say yes, I am, I can say I am a, a, an effective negotiator. Yes, I am. <laughs> I've come to that realization, I am. So I'm still working on it. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, I think it's important important to understand what your value is when going into a negotiation. Um, how much you bring to the table and so how competitive you are for the position as much as the position is competitive for you. And you have to be willing to know what your bottom line is and what you're willing to walk away for. Um, and so I was um, about six months into this position. I had moved here from Chicago for the job at Vera, and I was offered, I was um, 
presented with an opportunity back in Chicago. And it was probably the only job that I would have stayed in Chicago for and that I wouldn't have left to come to Vera for. And I was open with my boss. You know, I told her, you'll never guess what phone call I got today. And she said, you have to pursue this. It's an amazing opportunity. Um, at the end of the day, they winded up offering me a salary at $30,000 less than what they told me the position would be for. <laughs> Um, and you have to know what is negotiable and what's not. The state had a very strict policy of only offering 5% more than what you currently make. And so I made a decision that that wasn't worth uprooting my life six months after I just uprooted my life and I turned down the position. I knew that it was $30,000 less than what the last person made and what any other person in that position. And I thought I was more valuable to that position, and so I was willing to walk away from that. But you have to be willing to do that or know what you need. There's a want and there's a need. You can ask for what you want, but you should know at that point what your need is mm -hmm. um, when you're going into the negotiation, I would say. So I'm gonna deviate from the questions I sent them in advance. So I'm wondering, you know, there's the functional side of all this, gathering your information, using your mentors to sort of bounce ideas off of, and actually doing the negotiation. But what are the emotions that you go through in this process, <laughs> and how do you manage them? Wow. Because it's an emotional thing to do. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, <clears throat> I, thank God I have a really great husband who is like a great supporter. And so I would go home and just have all this stuff, you know, like, but, you know, such and such makes more and such and such has a great relationship with such and such. Because, you know, in your mind, you're like, well, why is that person making more? You have all these reasons that you're coming up with only because you, you're chicken. You know, for me, I was trying to chicken out of going in and asking. Um, but the bottom line is, you know, I, I had to look at myself in the mirror and say, no, I am worthy. I'm I, I deserve this, I feel like, you know, and and so it was just it was a, a lot of emotions for me because I had a. I, I just was struggling a lot with worthiness, and, and, and that came out in this whole, you know, negotiating time for me. So I had to work through that, and it was good because, you know, I came out on the other side. I went ahead and I asked for it, and I got what I had asked for. So certainly for me, it was just looking at myself in the mirror and, and just really struggling with that unworthiness thing that I didn't see since I was, like, in my younger 20s, you know? So it was, um, it was really interesting. So. I would say that was, that was one of the things I think I had to struggle with, was uh, worthiness. Yeah, I would say the same thing, the self-worth, and I think this is where your mentor can really play a role. Um, we have a new director of human resources um, at my office, and we became close very early on. And I remember when I was applying for the executive MPA program at Baruch, <laughs> and- Forgiven, you, forgiven. <laughs> And, you know, I sat down with her and I said, you know, I'm considering this, but why would they consider me? I'm the only person at my level at my office that doesn't have a graduate degree. Um, most people the level below me have a graduate degree. And they have a graduate degree from Harvard and Yale and Princeton. And I have a bachelor's degree from a state school, right? Um, and she said, do you realize what you did last week? And I said, what are you talking about? She goes, you just went and presented at an international conference in front of corrections professionals and police chiefs on a certain topic. She's like, you present at conferences all the time like it's no big deal. That's a huge deal. I don't think you realize how, how big of a role you have and how impressive it is. And man, was she right. I mean, I walked into the first interview with the head of the program I sat down, maybe said hello in one other word, and he said, I love your experience. I love what you've done. What do you need to know about the program? He walked in ready to sell me on the program when I was walking in thinking I needed to sell myself. Yeah. And I, so she was right. Um, and so I think other people, especially mentors, can help you really have clarity on your self-value and your self-worth when we, especially as women, tend to doubt ourselves all the time. That's good. So um, that's a good segue into this topic of mentorship. I'm going to deviate yet again. So do you consider yourself someone with 
a small number of very potent mentors, one, two, three, or someone who seeks out the appropriate mentors at the right time in the right place, and you could have 30 of them in your Rolodex that you can sort of call on when you need them. Hmm. I, I mean, I've been fortunate to really um, just have the potent, I, Sometimes when you have too many, it's like, you know, it's hard to manage too because you, you want to maintain those relationships. But I have a good solid three. And, I, and, and in fact, it is growing. I'm always open. I mean, hopefully I'll find a mentor in you and you can find one in me. Um, I'm always open to learning from people, um, particularly those who are um, higher than me in terms of their education and their career. So um, the, the, the core three that I have have been those who, for one, um, hired me in my current role, well, in my current job anyway. Um, secondly, the one who um, promoted me to my current role. And thirdly, it was actually by chance that I met this person. Um, she and I were doing um, sort of what we're doing tonight, um, and we kept in contact, and she's been my mentor ever since. So these are the three people who I go to um, and bounce ideas off of um, occasionally. And also, if I need to vent, because, you know, within... Um, you know, human resources, you, there's so many things that you see that you, that can affect you as a person that you need to just speak to someone who understands. You know, if you go home and talk to your husband, he doesn't really understand exactly why that bothers you so much. But if you have someone who actually um, is in the role that you're in, who could understand the stresses of the work. Um, so it's, it's important to have that outlet for sure. But um, yeah, I would say I have a core three, but it's, it's growing. I'm, I'm open to adding on more. I would say the same. I have probably a core two or three that I've kind of picked up along the way. And I've actually found that my mentors have kind of found me as their mentees more mm -hmm. than I found them as my mentors in the beginning when the relationship was developed. They really kind of latched on to me as someone that they saw having um, a good potential future and wanted to help foster that and kind of impart their wisdom on me. Um, you know, when I you know, when I was applying for different jobs and I was applying for a fellowship and I felt bad going back to the same people asking for advice. I felt bad going back to the same people asking for yet another recommendation. Mm -hmm. And um, one of my mentors introduced me to this concept of um, when you are campaigning and when you are fundraising for campaigning and how one of the strategies that they use is actually something you can apply in this life. Mm -hmm. And that is that when people are looking for a donor, what's the first people, that, who are the first people they go back to? Previous donors, right? When somebody has already contributed to your success, they are now vested into your success and want to see you continue to succeed. So don't ever feel bad if you only have two or three to keep going back to them because they're just as much invested in you because they've put time and work and energy into you as, as your mentor. Okay, so the last question I'm gonna ask and then I think we have some time for a few from the audience is we've talked about the, we've talked about negotiation, we've talked about mentorship and where the two meet. Hmm. How is this distinctive in the public sector? versus any other industry, banking, law? So I think there's a few things. One, I think that the limitations that um, either a public agency or a nonprofit organization has is much more rigid than a for-profit um, company may have. It's interesting, I found when I, was look, when I was planning on negotiating for my current job, I was shocked that I went to someone that I don't consider a mentor. I went to a man who is in the for-profit sector because I knew he had effectively negotiated before. And for some reason, I didn't go to my mentors who are all mostly women. I just realized that <laughs> while sitting here. Um, but, you know, um, so I think that's part of it. I think you have to know in the public sector even more what's negotiable and what's not. Mm -hmm. You don't want to waste your time on trying to negotiate something that they have no room to budge on. Um, and that's not something I think people need to consider as much. I also think in the public sector, um, you can negotiate on things outside of salary. 
there's more flexibility in that than there might be in the in the private sector where it's more focus on the money but if you would ask to work from home two days a week they would look at you you know like you're crazy so that's a good segue to darlene yeah actually i was i was gonna you know negotiation isn't just all about money um i'm not sure if this is even going to answer your question but i just wanted to make this um point you can negotiate anything yeah you know for me it was couple of things. Well, at the time when my son, was, when I just had my son, working from home was something that I really needed at the time. And so I was able to negotiate that as well as, you know, an agency vehicle, um, you know, a Blackberry, an iPad, you know, different things that would help me do my job effectively um, that, you know, ordinarily any other employee probably wouldn't have access to. And these are all things that were actually granted. But you know, negotiation isn't just, you know, asking for a salary bump. It can also be um, asking for additional responsibilities. And so that can assist you in catapulting your career down the road. Even if you're not going to see the money, at least you have now the experience um, to down the road say, well, I was able to handle this and I, and I effectively worked with this unit and I actually handled this project. And that will help you in the long run mm -hmm. in becoming um, um, qualified for a position down the road. So you can negotiate, you know, additional responsibilities. You can also negotiate um, a more senior um, title. Even if you're not given additional responsibilities, you can now ask for a senior title if you've been in a role longer than three years. You know, I had this one dy dynamite, dynamite, fantastic employee who was in um, a unit that didn't really utilize her, her talents and her skills. And she would always come into my office and she would be frustrated, she would cry, you know. I was always that shoulder for her to cry on. And she came in and she said, you know, I, I'm really at the end of my rope here, I feel like I'm dying. And that really hurt me to hear her say that. And she said, you know, I feel like, cause she was just doing like administrative type work and this was like a really bright girl. And I said, you know, why don't we see what we can do? I don't wanna, you know, I didn't wanna lose her. So there was, thankfully there was an opening in another unit that would allow her to do more substantive work. So she was doing sort of like background checks and in, like small type investigations. Well, she did that so well that she, the assistant commissioner took notice and actually gave her more responsibility. And at that time we started to um, hire new employees in that unit and she became sort of like a mentor, a supervisor to those people, like, you know, unofficially. And within a year's time, she's now the assistant director of that unit. And um, actually today, I spoke with her assistant commissioner. We're going to bump her up to um, deputy director. So, you know, that was like, you know, one of the things. And, and going back, I mean, I'm scatterbrained right now because I'm thinking about all these things with this one person. But, you know, with a mentor, you also want someone who's going to advocate for you. You know, and I, and I love your point. You know, don't be afraid, like don't, you're not gonna out, uh, you know, where you're welcome. If someone believes in you, if they love you, if they, if they look at you and see something there, they'll push for you, they'll work for you, they'll advocate for you, like I did with this young woman. Um, I, I said to the assistant commissioner, listen, there's this great girl, she works down the hall, you probably don't even notice her because she's stuck behind a desk filing paperwork, but take a chance on her and, and see what's there. And, and look at her now, she's the deputy director of this unit, so, you know, it's important to find a mentor who, not just so that you can go to them and ask for a letter of recommendation or someone who you can, uh, you know, have lunch with occasionally, but someone who you know truly believes in you. And that's so powerful and that's so important. And, I, and, and I'm lucky to even have that, someone who believed in me enough to push me to where I am today. Um, and, and those relationships are fostered through, you know, not just calling, don't just badger someone, you know what I mean? Don't, you know, but it's just asking, like, really think about questions that you want that person to answer and have thought-provoking questions. And, and, and even if it's just five minutes of their time, you know, ask a question and, and, and get that question answered. And, and they'll look at you and say, you know what, that was actually really good. You're not just, you know, someone says, hey, you have five minutes and you're just wasting your time. But, you know, make sure that when you are um, seeking out a mentor, you're, you're really utilizing their time effectively. Okay, so we're going to push ahead. Um, I'm going to underline two things to, to add to what Darlene just said. Um, but two of my rules are, the first one, don't stop at no the first time. Um, I see a lot of folks making that mistake. They hear no and they just shut down. Um, an effective negotiator says, 
well, let me step back a second, and what about this, what about this? That's the negotiation piece versus just asking for something. Um, and the second one is this, this quote, what would I need to do? So I want a new title. You can't, I can't give it to you right now. What would I need to do over the next six months so that when we have this conversation again, you'd be in a better position to give me an affirmative answer? And I think that'll help you plan that negotiation is not just 30 minutes in an office. It might take six months uh, to get where you want to go. Okay, so we're going to flip over um, to our groups right now because um, I talked too much and got us off schedule, and Natalie's giving me dirty looks in the back. Um, <laughs> she can do that. Um, we're going to flip to our groups, and what I want you to do for this group activity, I have three scenarios, and I want you to role play at your tables. So allow one person, or maybe in pairs if that's more comfortable, but allow one person to take a stab at what you would say in the situation, right? And maybe have the other person be the whoever it is you're asking something of, right? Whether it's the boss or the CEO or the director, whoever that is. So um, I don't know that we have enough staff to go to every table, but I think Darlene's going to go to a table. Darlene's not going to go to a table. <laughs> Wait, I'm sorry. Do you mind if I give my information? Yes. Okay, I apologize. I do have to run out. My husband just texted me. Our 19-month-old son is like having a tantrum right now, so <laughs> I have to go rescue him. Um, but I would love to hear from you. I mean, I'm always here at John Jay as much as I can be, so I always give out my business cards. Unfortunately, I don't have enough this evening. So um, my email address is D Martinez M-A-R-T-I-N-E-Z, at B as in boy, I, C as in Charles, um, bsd.nyc.gov. <laughs> And um, any questions you have for me, please feel free to forward them to me. Um, check out our website for any um, openings and forward me your resume. Thank you so much for having me. And, and Sarah has to go catch a flight. Yes, I have to head to an all-day meeting in DC tomorrow. I apologize. Um, I can give you my contact information as well. So my email address is S. Sullivan. So S-S-U-L-L-I-V-A-N at Vera, V-E-R-A dot org, O-R-G. And we are always hiring and we love John Jay graduates, so. Yes. Fantastic. So thanks to Sarah and Darlene. All right, so now you have something to go off of. So Professor D'Agostino, Professor Elias, myself, Barbara Young, who's a career counselor in the Career Center, Natalie, who is actually also a graduate assistant in the Career Center, um, will be floating around and sort of popping in. But role play number one. So you're in an elevator. So you know what's coming up, right? The elevator pitch, <laughs> right? You encounter the director of your dream job organization in an elevator, say, in the T building. You have 30 seconds. What do you say so that she'll remember you? So I'm going to do maybe about four or five minutes if you give a couple people a chance to try it out and give the folks feedback. So everybody else at the table, give feedback to the person who goes. Go. For a couple people to go at your table. You've had time? All right. All right. So this table is sharing like all their truths right now. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. Um, so. This is sort of a soft lift off of this conversation, right? So this is my mean career development director hat on right now. Every single person in this room should have this pitch ready to go in your back pocket at all times. We call it the elevator pitch. We even have a tip sheet on it on our website. You can look it up anytime. Um, it's like a 30 second, this is who I am, this is what I know about you, this is what I need from you. And that's it. Right? And then always have a business card. And my other shameless dirty secret is I never have business cards. I'm so bad at it. Um, all right. So it's round number two. We're going to do the same process again. All right. You're an employee. Your child's school play, which are very important, is the same day as a major work event. You need to ask your supervisor to be away from the office. So someone at the table be the supervisor. Someone be the asker. 
and have the conversation. Don't just stop at the first question, but play out a conversation, okay? It's okay to be as mean as you want if you're a supervisor. Has everybody had a chance to do one, maybe two, or just chat about this in general? We sort of did that. Okay, so here's the one, right? You've just been offered a position as a program manager at a medium-sized nonprofit in New York City. You were hoping to make 60,000, but the offer is for 50. You have concerns about making this work given childcare and commuting costs. The pressures that you're feeling financially with this. So, you've gotten the offer. You've got to, let's assume you're calling them back. Because like good folks, you probably asked for a few days to think about the offer when they first called. Please tell me you are. <laughs> Thank you, right? All right, so you're calling them. We have a question. Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> Let's assume you're making 48 right now. We got another question. I'm going to let that one linger. And this is a new hire. You do not work for this organization already. Because I promised Natalie I would get us back on time. Thank you, Will. I'm almost there. All right, so I am loving the conversation that's going on. And the interesting thing to me is a lot of you are sort of asking questions about the premise of the scenario. And in asking those questions, you're actually doing the brainstorming that you need to be doing when you're confronting this. So at this table, Michael said, well, what if I've got internships and what, I've got, what if I've got prior experience? You should definitely be thinking about that in the negotiation process. That gives you something to work from. Tipley said, um, I should be thinking about the whole package, right? What if it's not just salary? Yes, right? It's, it's more than salary. How can you negotiate to get around that? So we're going to take questions from you. And I understand that we have one from Twitter. We do. So with all this talk, of mentorship, how do you find a mentor? So, um, I would normally let the panel do this, but since they're gone. Um, so for me, um, mentorship has been about people that I connect with. And so, you know, you're in a meeting with someone or you're in a class with a professor, you're having coffee, you just connect well, and you, you sort of have this experience of, I just wanna sit and listen to this person. Like, I feel like I would learn a lot. I just want to listen to you all the time because you're going to show me something that I didn't know. And so those are the people that then I initiate contact with, right? When I was younger, that was standing outside my boss's door so that every time she left, I was standing there. That can be a little creepy. <laughs> can be a little creepy. Especially when she turned around and said, well, I'm going to the bathroom and you can't come with me. <clears throat> um, the other ways that I've done it are, you know, um, if I see that they've accomplished something, I send a quick note. Hey, I just saw this. Congratulations. I'm looking forward to getting together with you and celebrating when we see each other. Boom. Right? So that's the give and take of the, the mentorship. And I find them um, in graduate school. If you, uh, for those of you who are students at John Jay, if you leave John Jay, without at least one faculty member who's, who you know would be a reference for you, whether it's a job or a gr another graduate school application for a PhD or another master's degree, you haven't done your work while you've been here, right? And you have to maintain that relationship because it may be 15 years later when you need that reference and maybe they'll forget about you. Or maybe they've left John Jay and gone to another campus, although why would you? It's so amazing here. But you need to maintain the relationship so for those very reasons. So graduate school is a great opportunity, or undergrad. Internships, supervisors at internships, because they're already signing on to your learning and growth, hopefully. 
they're a good internship supervisor. On the job, you know, we will all find supervisors or colleagues that we just enjoy their perspective. Professional associations are a huge way to find mentors because people join these associations to network and meet other people in the same industry. So find out what the organizations are in your field and make sure that you're joining them and participating in what they're doing. Anybody else have thoughts on finding mentors? I do. Um, <laughs> I do. Did Our faculty. So, do you go, so because this comes up a lot with students, do you actually go up to someone or write them and say, hey, can you be my mentor? Or is that, <laughs> because, or is it something that comes about more naturally? Right. Because yeah. it, even in the Samberg book, you know, she said, don't ask someone yeah. to be your mentor. And so I'm just wondering what your perspective was on that. So I think identifying mentors is a lot like identifying best friends, right? <laughs> when we were nine, we probably said, will you be my best friend, <laughs> right? And then next week it was like, I hate you, and now that's my best friend. <laughs> Mentorship can be like that. Um, it's probably not appropriate as an adult to just walk up to someone and say, hey, will you be my mentor, without having any prior knowledge or relationship <laughs> with them. But I think it is perfectly acceptable in the relationship to say, Maria, I've really enjoyed the time that I've gotten to spend from you, and you've helped me understand this, this sort of role a lot more clearly. You know, I view you as a mentor, and I'm just wondering, is that something that you'd be okay if I bounce ideas off of you from time to time? I think, so I think there is a time and a place where it's okay to ask someone straight out, but you have to have that, the connection first, and, and that connection is built just like you build friendships. Same time, same place, being near them, asking them questions, learning about who they are, and just putting yourself out there. It, just to echo that, yes, I agree that the you know relationships that develop more organically are definitely more impactful for both parties. Um, in addition to asking a lot of questions, I would say to students, don't be afraid to take initiative. So if you find in a class that you have a faculty member um, or even a colleague, a classmate, that has shared research interest or you're working in similar fields, definitely connect with them and ask a lot of questions about that research. And don't be afraid to ask for opportunities because then the formal mentorship relationship develops from those uh, initial starting points. The other thing that I will share is um, informational interviews can be a great way if you have no other connections to a field. Identify some folks who are appropriately positioned. So I wouldn't reach out to Sheryl Sandberg directly. <laughs> I might reach out to someone lower on the chain first at the Facebook HQ. But uh, informational interviews, reaching out to them and saying, this is who I am. I think you have information about this. Can I have a phone conversation? Can I buy you a cup of coffee? Can I stop by your office? We also have a tip sheet on informational interviews on the Center for Career Information Development's website. <laughs> Look it up. There's a question. Yep. I know that, please um, ask questions. But I know Paige at that table Paige? By where has a Paige. question that I'm sure other people have. Hi, so I was just wondering, um, when we were looking at this um, question, it came to me that uh, how do you know how, ma how much other people make when you're asking to negotiate? Paige, I love you. <laughs> Thank you for that. Let me share some tips. So there's a great website called payscale.com. Everybody write it down. Payscale.com is thousands, hundreds of thousands of people go to this website and report their salaries. They also report what school they came from. So you can see, for instance, the average starting salary of everyone who graduated in 2012 from Harvard. Um, pay scale is good. O-net, O asterisk net, just Google that. O-net is a database maintained by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. You can look up a job title you can find the median wage for that job title nationally and by state. So literally you can look up EMT technician and it'll tell you what EMT technicians make nationally in New York State. You will also shortly have access in a couple of weeks 
The college has just gotten access to something called the Career Insider. Career Insider. It's by a company called Vault, and it'll be on John Jay Careers Online in a couple of weeks. We're just finishing the final details. Career Insider has much of the same information as ONET, but you can also look at, it's almost like a Yelp review, right? So other people have written up like, I hate this job because, I love this job because. You can actually read what other people say. So those three, if I know nothing about an industry, that's where I start to see what are people making. There's also websites, like if you're applying for New York State, there's a website called seethroughny.com that you can look up any state employee salary, including mine. And you're all gonna look up my salary now. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine, it's public information. Um, uh, then, so that's my publicly available information. Then I find informants in the organization or allied, right? So if I want to know what a corporate attorney at Skadden Arps makes, but I don't know anybody at Skadden Arps, I bet that a corporate attorney at Paul Weiss probably has some idea what a corporate attorney at Skadden Arps makes, right? So nonprofits in the same issue area Typically, there's a lot of uh, people moving from one to the other. So if you have informants, they may be able to give you a sense of people in this area typically make around this amount of money. Because you're right, Paige, you never want to go into a negotiation blind. Because it's that $40,000 question, right? If you're asking for 40 and they can only give you 10, you don't want to be caught there. Mm -hmm. Other questions, Joshua? Here, here. Oh. Hi. Uh, so my question is, I know is some uh, public positions, there's a salary range. Mm -hmm. uh, when you negotiate, do you, you work within that range, of course, right? Yeah, so, um, but that range can be sometimes quite expansive. I think the salary range for my title is like 55 to 116, right, I think. I'm looking at Kim Chandler and Relisa Galloway-Perry, who are also John Jay staff and who are here and they're fabulous people and just wave, <laughs> wave. Um, uh, Cause I, yeah. So anyway, um, I, t I had to ask them before I did that. Uh, so you do want to know what the range is. Federal jobs, you want to look at the, G the GS scale, right? But the GS scale can be really big too. So there are some things that you will just never know. You will never know that even within that huge range, I actually, the hiring manager, have a budget and I can't go over this budget, right? You may not know that. Um, so sometimes you will find yourselves in a situation where you need a certain salary and they just can't do it. Um, and you know, then you have to make the best decision you can in the situation. But usually if they're working on a scale, the scale's publicly available. And you could then look at what of the last five people in that job title or that job title area what have they been, what do they make? Maybe that information is publicly available too. Yeah. Oh, one back here? Oh, sorry. Oh, do I go first? Okay. So I was always told not to bring up salary in an interview, not to be the first person to bring it up. So how do I go about negotiating if I don't even know what the salary is, if they haven't even mentioned anything like that? Yeah. Okay, so with the assumption that there was no salary on the job posting. Right? So that's our assumption. And that there's no salary information publicly available on a website. So that's assumption number two. So what I do is I don't wait till I get to the interview portion. If I'm even thinking about applying for a job where I'm wondering what it is, I go ahead and I call the human resources office or whoever I know in that organization and I say, hey, I see that you have this posting for this position. Do you, do you mind if I just ask you a couple of quick questions? And I have like four or five questions that are just sort of routine. Does the position supervise anyone else? Who supervises the position? Can you give me a sense of the salary range? And that's exactly how you phrase it. You never say, what's this person going to make? <laughs> <laughs> Which is really what you want to know, right? But you've got to make it easy for them to answer without sort of giving you their hand, right? Showing you their hand. Can you give me a sense of the salary range that you expect this position to be in? Because you want to make sure that you're in the right ballpark, right? That you're not applying for something that's crazy low, 
or that's crazy high and, and above you. Um, if you forget to do that, the advice you've been given is, is correct. I, I would not bring it up in an interview because you run the risk of being seen as someone who's more concerned with the salary than with the job itself. You want to show your attraction to the job responsibilities. You can do it in a, um, in a post-interview pre-offer, sort of like that window of time. You can say, um, hey, Jessica, I, had, I really enjoyed interviewing with you and the committee last week. I had some follow-up questions. Can I give you a call tomorrow? Because you want to do that in a one-on-one. -on -one. You definitely don't want to do it in a search committee if there's more than one pe person. And then the next place is offer land, right? For me, I don't negotiate on the first call. When they call, <laughs> evidently I don't negotiate anyway, but um, I don't encourage anyone to negotiate on the first call. When they call to give you the job offer, your first response is thank you <laughs> first. You're, and then you, um, if there's any sort of other follow-up questions, you might ask them that. But you're going to say, I really appreciate the offer. I need some time to think about this. When can I get back to you? Right? It's totally fine for you. Most people are OK with the week, but they're gonna, they want an answer right now. I want an answer tomorrow. Um, when we work with employers at the college, we generally ask them to give you at least a week to think about a job offer. And I'll tell you, we've had some conversations with employers who've tried to give 24 hours notice. And we get in and advocate in that situation, because I just don't think it's good practice. Um, so you can ask for that time to think. And then when you call them back to say, I've had some time to think. I've looked at my finances, which is a good way to sort of count uh, cash this. I really, it would be difficult for me to accept the position unless I was making this, is there a way that we can get closer to that number? And that's how I started. That's, well, again, when I don't. Hi. Um, I just wanted to find out, like, what's the best approach if you actually started out at a set position mm -hmm. at a certain range, income range, and then your responsibilities changed? Mm. Now, how do you try to negotiate now that you work and you're, you're doing more things than what you actually, you know, signed right. up for. Like, when, at what point do you negotiate mm -hmm. an increase? So I think Darlene was talking about that, right? Darlene said, at some point I realized I was doing the work of a person at this level. So you just go, you, you sort of, you know, think about it very uh, strategically. You may not write a proposal, but you may write a memo that outlines your argument. Here's what I've done. Here's what I'm currently doing that maybe is outside my job title. Here's what I'd be willing to do more. Here's what you could expect if you did this for me. So humbly, I sort of you know, request this new title or this reclassification. Now, that's all couched by saying different organizations do this differently. If you're at an organization that's unionized or that's highly um, this is not the technical term, but highly policied, right? Where there's lots and lots of HR policy. There's more likely to be set processes that you go through, right? So at John Jay, if I want to ask for a reclassification, I have to write a proposal. My boss has to endorse it or not. It has to go before a classification committee. They have to review it. So there's a very specific set of steps that you take to do that here. Right. Right. But remember the story I told you about why I didn't feel comfortable negotiating? Because they painted a picture that made it seem like negotiation would be futile? That's their job. Right. Yeah. Yep. 
So, right. So sometimes there's this analogy of birds on a wire. And if you ever get really bored and sit around and watch a bunch of birds on a, like a you know, telephone pole or something, you'll notice like one bird will get up and fly away and then come back. And then two or three birds will fly away and come back. Four or five birds will fly away and come back. And then the entire flock will go, right? So there's this metaphor that sometimes change takes a few iterations, but that every iteration builds on the one before it, right? So you may not be successful in ask number one, but ask number one is setting you up for three months later for ask number two, right? Which is setting you up for ask number three. Maybe that's what it takes to get you there. So I don't think I would encourage you to, be, to shy away from the ask if you feel like I'm doing more work and, and I really think I'm, I'm ready for this. I do want you to acknowledge to them, I understand where the organization is right now and I see what's happening around me. So I understand that having this conversation could seem weird, but here's what I'm willing to do for you. I see you struggling in this area. I can do that for you. Here's what I would need in order to do that. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, in, in my last gig, um, uh, my boss got fired, right? I did one thing really bad and one thing really well. Um, I went the day after and said, obviously her work, somebody's got to do it. Would you like me to do it? And they said yes. And I say that's a good thing, because if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't be here, because I would never have had that experience, which was a pretty critical piece of my background. What I did bad was I didn't ask for her office. <laughs> I'm not lying. It was a nice office. It was a corner office, view of Riverside Park. A colleague who was a little junior than I was and didn't have as much responsibility walked to the boss's office and said, hey, it's empty, can I have it? Sure. <laughs> so I go to work and he's moved in next door. I didn't ask, and that's the whole point, right? I saw something I want, I didn't think about, I didn't even think it was a possibility. I, I actually thought, they'll go, well, Will's doing the job, he probably deserves that. <laughs> and I thought I was just waiting for them to like, hire some movers to move me down the hall. But no, they're, they're, you have to ask for it. Right? And so I think it's, it's iterations. Do we have time for one more? Last question. Last question. Yes. We can continue the comments and questions after. So. Okay. So I have a question from the other end of the negotiation okay. table. Um, what if you're the person who has now, you have an employee that comes up to you, they want their raise. They deserve it. Um, <clears throat> you're a nonprofit or you're in a department where your budget is too tight to give it to them. Mm -hmm. Where do you go to help them out so you don't lose a good employee? Right. Bad boss says, nope, sorry, and leaves it at that. That is the boss who's not interested in your future, could care less whether you're here or go, you're replaceable, right? You are a cog, a wheel, what's the metaphor? <laughs> a cog in the watch, something, right? Um, I don't wear a watch. Um, good boss understands why. Why is this important to you right now? and tries to help you think about other solutions, right? Good boss also makes sure that the, um, that the person that they're supervising knows the landscape, right? I actually had to do this recently. And what was important was for me to say, I've called HR and here's what I now know. There are this many ways that a person in our organization could get a raise. These are the reasons why one and two aren't options. Option three is you get another offer and come to me and say, if you want to keep me, here's the salary I need. But the downside of that is I may say, bye, bye Felicia, right? <laughs> Have a nice day. So that it's, a, it's a risk. But what was important was I had to give that person all of the information that I had. Because if they're going to make a decision that affects their family and their future, they need to have all of that. And that, that's where you establish the trust, which is really critical. And then you just have to sort of, how can I help you through this decision? How can I help you through this conversation? Um, 
I think once you have the trust, then we can, we can work together, right? Because that's when, well, maybe I can't give you the salary, but if I let you work from home two days a week, you're not commuting into the city two days a week, which you don't have to pay for parking, you don't have to pay for gas, if it's a possibility. And there are some jobs where you just can't work from home, right? Um, and that's where you start thinking about the package as a whole and trying to work out something around that. But again, as, as a supervisor, when I'm in that situation, the first decision that I have to make, and it has to happen in a split second, is how invested am I in this person being a member of my team? And that's where, flip back to, you're the employee. You want to make sure that you're a valued member of the team and that they want you there, because that puts you in a good bargaining position. Cool? All right, thank you all so much. Hi, thank you, Will. So I know that there are probably a lot more questions, but I also know that some people probably um, have to leave. So we'll formally close, but if you have the time and you would like to stick around, we could do a bit more questions um, and answers for a little bit. So um, all I want to say is um, that Thank you for coming. We have so far uh, one event scheduled, uh, Women in Public Sector event scheduled in February on the 25th. It's a scholar's lunch. And we have a yet to be determined date and uh, speaker for a lecture in the spring. So just continue following us on our website via Twitter. And uh, you'll know who it is and when that is. A special thanks to uh, Natalie Wensler, our graduate assistant. <laughs> Uh, for this project. She's been really helpful. And again, thank you everyone for coming and for the great conversation and the participation um, tonight. So I will now um, pass it back <laughs> to, if you have to leave, you know, of course you do so. If there are some questions, I know that there were some questions that you would like to ask, that we could continue that um, conversation. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're so comfortable in your... Yeah, they're all gone.